But if you don't account for the variables required to correct biomechanics, then any study you do that says mechanics don't matter becomes irrelevant. Just because physios and other health practitioners can't fix mechanics, it doesn't mean that they don't matter. Hey everyone, this is Lewis from Functional Patterns Brisbane here. I'm a physiotherapist that graduated in 2012 in Brisbane, Australia, and I transitioned towards functional patterns about six years ago when I realized the science I was using wasn't really giving my clients the best result that I thought it could be giving them. If you wanna know more about my history, I did a video with Nyadi about six months ago that I'll link in the description for you to have a look at. The video I'm gonna be doing today is going to be addressing the common school of thought amongst physios when they talk about functional patterns, with re especially with regards to posture and biomechanics. And we're gonna to touch on the biopsychosocial model, which is kind of the prevalent model in physiotherapy, and especially in recent times has kind of overtaken the biomechanical model. Let's preface this video first of all by saying that most to all of the physios we encounter online have rarely, if ever, trained with a human biomechanics specialist or downloaded any material available by functional patterns. This isn't to say in life that you need to have done something to experience it and understand it, but when you're making some of the claims that the physios make about functional patterns, it definitely helps to understand by doing first. I think a really good part about this video is that I'm both a functional patterns practitioner and a physiotherapist. So if credentials are what matter to you, then this video should really help a lot in beginning to understand our position. The first study I wanna bring up is one from Zadro in 2019, which basically found that 46% of physios don't follow best practice guidelines. So I'll repeat that, 46% of physios don't follow best practice guidelines. Does that give you the consumer confidence or a physio confidence to go to them for help in, if you're in acute or chronic pain or to learn from them if you're a student? Is that number acceptable for a profession that is recognized worldwide as the place to go if you sustain an injury? A common rebuttal I get here is that the newer science makes physiotherapy better and that curriculums are currently taught at universities and colleges are outdated. The problem is the lecturers at those universities that have outdated curriculums are usually the ones leading or that have done the research. When you hear studies like this, it's no real wonder that people are turning to visible results like FP rather than potentially a coin flip of 46% going into a clinic. It's just something to think about when you hear people online only ever saying cite your studies. We wanna be asking these people, can you show me that these studies are able to be replicated on the population you're actually treating? And it's with this in mind that we have to realize that peer reviewed and traditional research is inherently flawed. Mike Musiolo from Functional Patterns has done a great couple of videos recently, the first one on sugar and the second on the back squat. And we'll be delving into the peer reviewed method in the future with a video, so keep your eye out for that. But effectively, the amount of variables required to correct mechanics, something no one else in the industry does is it's countless. For those of you that are new to FP or are just discovering FP, I encourage you, look on our Instagram, look on our website, look around the hundreds of practitioners worldwide that we have. The results that we're showing here are from people that have tried the science that is being mentioned and that science isn't able to help them, i.e. they can't replicate those studies on real clients. Now, this could be due to a number of factors which we can go into, but generally speaking, it's the research is done on a completely different population or taken into a completely different context to the one that we're needing to look at. So with this, we need to look at publication and replication bias. Now, publication bias is nothing new and it's definitely not specific to physiotherapy or the health industry in general even, but it's widely known that publications are more likely to release research that confirms an author's hypothesis than one that rejects it. They often get left to the side. Where I really wanna look a little bit closer is replication bias. Brian Nosek, a psychologist from the University of Virginia, decided to look at this hypothesis by testing 100 psychology studies that were mainly correlational or experimental to see if they were able to be replicated by his team. Now, originally 97% of these studies had significant results. When they tried to replicate them, they ended up with 36% significant results. 36%. This means that 61% of the research done was unable to be replicated. Now, I wanna push home here that my point, isn't the num my point isn't that the number has dropped off so much, although 61% is like a massive drop off. My point mainly is that what we're reading is inherently unreliable. So we have to be able to use 
critical thinking to be able to move forward. Now, a very good quote I heard was from Rasmus Benestad, who's a climate researcher. Now, he undertook a similar experiment in his field with similar results. But basically, he said, science is never settled, and both the scientific consensus and the alternative hypothesis should be subject to ongoing questioning. I understand the irony that we're addressing poor research here by looking into research, but I want to make it clear that we at FP absolutely think that good hard science and research is necessary and that everyone should be held accountable to the same standards in the industry. Our view, however, is that the metrics used to establish those standards are generally very poor and need a lot more attention before we completely rely on them. The next thing I want to look at is some research commonly given to us by physios to suggest that poor biomechanics and specifically muscle imbalances are poor predictors of pain and injury. These are five reviews and articles that I had a close look at, and we'll link them all in the description um, if you want to have a deeper look. So here's the summary. So the average age of these articles participants was somewhere between 24 to 27. Now, I did a little bit of digging on patient demographics in physiotherapy, which again, might be similar or different depending on what industry, what country, what type of clinic they're at. I'm just trying to play by the research rules at the moment. And this research showed that 61% of physio clients were 50 or over, with 26% being between 18 to 49. Now, my anecdotal experience and those around the world from functional patterns, we find that there's a similar demographic of clients, although we tend to find more concentrated group in the 30 to 50 range. The next thing I saw in these studies is that in all but one, the population used were elite pro athletes generally NFL, AFL, rugby, and football or soccer. Although we do train athletes all over the world, these aren't the main population of people that we see. It's not to say that we don't want to focus on athletes. It's definitely something that we do want to look at, but we want to address the main cohort of people that walk into the doors that we need to help. Another thing I found was that the testing positions used to test strength were nothing like the positions these participants found themselves in when they were injured. For example, in one study about footballers, pro footballers, they tested adductor strength in a supine position with hips fixed, so basically on their back, pulling inwards. In another study, they tested hamstring and quad ratios in a seated hip flexion position, when in reality, ACL tears and hamstring tears are fairly traumatic injuries usually sustained in high sprint running or quick turns of motion. The other thing to note is that the position of the rest of the body wasn't mentioned. So you could have some participants with a huge posterior tilt and some with a huge anterior tilt. And at the very least, that will have a direct effect on the length of the hamstring to start with, which will change potentially the amount of power or output it can produce. Moving on to more of the methodological limitations of these studies. One of them looked, uh, the study was from Markovich. It looked at groin injuries again, but they only had a sample size of 10 participants. This means you can't really draw any strong or even moderate correlations with it. It's not to say that it's useless. It's to say that if you're going to use this study to reinforce a point that posture and biomechanics don't correlate with pain and injury, then this probably isn't the study that you're going to be referencing. In another review by Kellis, which was with regard to hamstring and ACL injuries and looking at quad and hamstring uh, ratios in strength, it was probably the most convincing study given to us but nine out of the 23 studies were at a high risk of bias. Now, once again, I want to repeat that this isn't to say that the correlations don't exist. It's just that you have to take all these results with a grain of salt. The usual duration for these prospective studies was a pre-season and then a season. So generally a nine to 12 month period. Now, these studies weren't longitudinal. They didn't look at a three to five year follow-up or anything like that. So. What they're saying is they're looking at young elite athletes tracked for the nine to 12 month period rather than that extended period of time where we may see older athletes and athletes progressing over time with their imbalances present with more correlation between these things. So in summary of this research, physios are generally arguing that imbalances only really predict injuries in those athletes that are already injured and that in the uninjured athlete population, the evidence isn't as strong which we know from Brian Nosek's research is a correlational factor in reproducibility of studies. So to use these studies to prove imbalance doesn't predict pain or injury is kind of strange considering they actually tend to agree with us 50% of the time with previously injured clients, while for the uninjured clients that come in, 
there's not really any strong or substantial evidence to say imbalances don't matter. And even in the one study that was, there's a high risk of bias. This might seem like a really small point, but it's really, really important to note here that the science being used isn't really strengthening the point they're making at all. So how often do people use this tactic, not just physios, how often is this tactic used when debating with traditional science or debating with people who are saying, cite your studies? One final study that I really wanna look at and probably the most notable was from Bennell, which physios often use to point out that pain can decrease despite attempts to change mechanics failing. Now we had a look at this study and specifically we looked at the exercises used to correct the mechanics in this study. And as you can see here, and especially for those who have trained with an FP prac, there's just not nearly enough variables being addressed. I'm gonna pause on this slide for a bit so you can have a little bit of a look through the exercises used. Specifically, I can see generally one to two variables being addressed at any one point of time. I wanna really clarify here that this is the best attempt at changing mechanics that's currently available. And this is the extent to which the industry judges the importance of mechanics. Now, a big point I wanna make here and a point that we'll probably go into more depth on a future video regarding the biopsychosocial model is the metrics that we use at Functional Patterns. In my experience as a physiotherapist, both in clinical care and university, we never really tested max sprint speed. We never really tested running in general. There was a little bit done on gait analysis, but not nearly enough to what my experience has been with helping people. In functional patterns, pain permitting, obviously, when people come in, it's a very, very key tool for us to assess what's happening on the body and to be able to account for more variables than are currently being addressed by this research and physios around the world. But if you don't account for the variables required to correct biomechanics, then any study you do that says mechanics don't matter becomes irrelevant. That is, in our opinion, why the biopsychosocial model is a lot more prevalent these days. And we absolutely believe it has its place and we'll be doing more videos on this. But just because physios and other health practitioners can't fix mechanics, it doesn't mean that they don't matter. The research that's referenced, as you've seen, doesn't really replicate at all the main demographic that most physios or functional patterns trainers see. It's young elite athletes as the primary research participants, which means that the best science isn't being used. There tends to be rather strong dissonance and bias being used. Basically, the burden of proof isn't on us. We're correcting scoliosis dynamically and people are coming to us for help. It's on you as physios to prove that what you do helps at all. It's often said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Now, I don't think what we're saying is extraordinary claims. I think that the bar has been set so low that what we do seems impossible. I challenge any physio that disagrees with this video to document your metrics and over a six month period, take a before and after gait video with a progression anywhere near the regularity and quality that FP achieves. Or better yet, show us multiple scoliosis changes that are significant, considering a common rebuttal we get to this is that scoliosis can correct naturally. To everyone else, thanks for watching. Keep an eye out in the future for more videos like this. And if you have any suggestions, feel free to pop them in the comments. And as always, don't forget to live intentionally, but not habitually. Cheers.